I love video games. I know that's already kind of obvious based on the kinds of videos I make, but when I say that, I also mean all the little facets that go into a game. Stuff like inspirations, influences, parallels to real life concepts, and the development. This is where the topic of today's video comes in. It's always interesting to see how things change in a game's development over time, or what things end up changing. For example, the Sonic 3 prototype was a goldmine of new information for fans. There are already videos out there exploring the Sonic 3 prototype in detail, so you can just watch those if you want to know more. What about Persona? Does this series have anything like that? Unfortunately, the only prototypes openly available as of the making of this video are very late in development builds. You can even load save data from the release versions, which I did for a couple of them. The only real glimpses we have at very early development for these games are concept art, a few clips, and maybe some interviews if you dig deep enough. Nonetheless, I figured I would explore these prototypes anyway to see if we can gain any insight, even just the tiniest bit, of what developing and testing these games might have been like. Before I begin, I want to give a little disclaimer. This is not a full comprehensive breakdown of all these prototypes. There's a lot of stuff I don't understand and quite frankly, I don't have the time to play through an entire Persona prototype to explore every little nook and cranny and explore everything it has to offer. What I'm going through with this video is simply what I managed to find within one to two hours of playing around. With that out of the way, Let's see how fast we can break these games. Of course, we gotta begin with where it all started. The original Persona. This is the August 2nd, 1996 prototype of the Japanese version of the game. Which is fine, although the idea of seeing what developing the English version was like would have been really interesting as well. I heard only like 12 people worked on that. Sounds like hell. Something you'll notice immediately is that there's a console output for every loading screen. This makes sense considering how there is a lot of transitioning between the isometric rooms, the 3D environments, and the battle scenes. This was a very experimental game at the time. Gotta make sure all that stuff is working properly. Something I noticed right at the beginning of the game is that when I pressed the triangle button, the Velvet Room stock menu appeared. Even though it appears blank, I was able to add a level 60 tower persona to my party's active stock. This is the only time you can do this, by the way. Not that it matters, though. Once you go through the first Persona Awakening, it's completely gone. Don't know what that's about. I noticed that during some scenes, you'll see these three rectangles in the bottom left. These don't really seem to serve a purpose, uh, as far as I can tell. Also, I got softlocked when I tried using a save point once. Instead of opening up the dialogue box asking me to save, it just spawned me in the room. I was free to walk around, but the only way out is to exit the save menu. I couldn't interact with anything in that room to prompt that, though. The really interesting stuff happens once you step outside. By pressing cancel on the world map, you can actually see all the tiles the player is able to walk on, represented by these red markers. This can be toggled simply by pressing cancel again and again. In the Japanese version, that would be the X button. It is also from here where you can press select to open up the debug menu. I don't really know what a lot of this stuff is, but here's what I was able to find just by playing around with it. You can switch into a free mode that lets you move around the map freely while ignoring bounds. You also move much faster in this mode. This is probably just to make it a lot easier to travel from place to place while test running the game. Going past the boundaries, you'll notice that the world map wraps in on itself. Using debug mode, you can actually go past certain sequence triggers. For example, I went past the one where Ellie is supposed to give the password at the school gate. Upon re-entering the school, it's not in its post-demon attack state. Your party doesn't disband, and you can't start the steps to begin the Snow Queen route. 
In the parameter settings, you've got quite a few options. I'm assuming to BTL will take us straight into a battle. So let's try it. Oh, this is Ellie's awakening, but Ellie's not in our party right now. Let's see what happens if we try to win the fight normally. So, because Ellie's not in my party, and the enemy can only be defeated by her, you're completely stuck. The enemy attacks the protagonist since Ellie's not there, but either way, the enemy will always miss. Your characters straight up do nothing no matter what you input. The only thing you can do is reset or load a save state. While we're on the topic of battles, you'll notice the debug text on screen. Again, I don't know what most of these numbers are supposed to mean. However, you'll notice a timer in green that I believe indicates your current playtime. I'm not sure how or why that would be relevant to the battles, but I thought it was worth pointing out. Moving on, let's check out to ADV now. I wonder what ADV stands for. Adventure? I want to go on an adventure. Let's go! Oh. It just loads you into the opening cutscene, without any of the character sprites. Disappointing. To 3D is pretty self-explanatory. It switches you into the 3D first-person perspective, but since the world map has no first-person map data, it just breaks the game. Pressing select will not open the debug menu since that button is already dedicated to hiding the HUD in 3D mode. So you can't switch back. Speaking of the 3D dungeon, let's talk about what you can do there. By holding X while walking, you can ignore collision detection and walk through walls. It's actually pretty interesting viewing the dungeons from a perspective that you're not supposed to. There's still a boundary for the 3D maps that you can't pass even with collision detection ignored. In the isometric perspective rooms, you can press select to reveal the tile coordinates for your character. That's about all I could find immediately for this prototype, so let's move on. Okay, I know this technically isn't a prototype, but I figured I might as well mention the Persona 2 Innocent Sin demo. This was released alongside the release of Soul Hackers, You'll open up straight to the title screen and be given 5 options. The bottom two are just for sound type and vibration settings, so we'll focus on the first three. The first option will play a story synopsis of the beginning portion of the game. Basically everything from the beginning to the end of the first dungeon, which is what this demo contains. The summary is narrated by Lisa and Ikichi, so there's some banter here and there. I don't speak Japanese though, so none of this really means much to me. The second menu option will play the demo, so let's get into it. You immediately spawn on the overworld next to Seven Sisters High. The game doesn't allow you to save your game or change your config, so we can assume this demo is going to be really short. The menu background and text box design are completely unique to this version if I recall correctly. The text box is a dark blue version of the grid design from the final game, and the menu background is a metallic grey version of the grid design. Just thought I would mention that since you guys apparently enjoy hearing me gush about UI. You could go straight into the dungeon, but I decided to explore around for a bit. The actual overworld theme doesn't play here, it's just the Seven's High theme. The first one from before the demons start roaming the school. There are only two districts to explore. You are able to spread some rumors and visit all of the shops, 
but the only really interesting things that you can do are visit Lisa's house and meet her father, and go to the sushi restaurant and meet Eikichi's father. You can visit the Velvet Room, but there really isn't any need to. None of the demons available are really worth getting, and I didn't even bother trying to contact any demons in this run. It's not like you particularly need them either, as all the enemies in the demo are just your mundane entry-level enemies. I tried performing Blazing Burst with Tatsuya and Yukino, but it didn't do anything. It seems at the moment the only fusion spell you can cast in this demo is Towering Inferno, the one with Tatsuya, Lisa, and Eikichi. You break all the emblems in the school, you get the key to the clock tower, you climb up there, and... To be continued. And then you get a cool little FMV to hype you up for the game. I've already played it though, so I think I'm good. The final main menu option lets you look at concept art. This will include the main characters, their personas, and some artwork of Sumaru City and the two schools. And that's all for the demo. Moving on to Eternal Punishment, we have the November 17th 2000 build. So, unlike the last two games I talked about, the Eternal Punishment prototype is actually in English. Once again, the whole game is playable. The main difference is mostly just debugging stuff. There are a lot more toggles to play around with in the dungeon. You can toggle collision with an option instead of needing to hold down a button like in Persona 1. You can straight up turn off encounters. Effect toggles the visual filter, which I didn't even know the first dungeon had. I guess all of the dungeons must have some sort of filter effect then. The more you know. You can also turn off doors, apparently. You can hide the HUD if you want some nice clean footage recordings. Display switches between normal and wireframe view. Or no, sorry, wireframe view. F Poly lets you toggle the visibility of walls and other 3D objects obstructing the camera view. You can make them invisible, semi-transparent, or completely opaque. You can brighten the background color of the void to a blinding white. Chests can be set to all opened or all closed, interestingly enough. A lot of the other stuff I played around with in the dungeon didn't seem to do anything, so let's get into battles. Some console text appears on every battle transition. Pressing select on the battle menu reveals debug and spell debug. In the debug menu you can change the battle backdrop, which is hella cool. I think background zero is just a test background, but I could be wrong. I don't quite remember if I saw it when playing the final game or not. There's a ton of sound options that look way too intimidating for me to even try to play with them. Turning off background music is in a separate sub-menu though. I tried using the jump option, but it just immediately ended the battle. Spell debug is pretty straightforward, it's used to test spell animations. You can also move the characters and enemies around the screen. Of course, playing around with these options without knowing what you're doing like me can lead to the game crashing. Now let's finally get to the overworld, shall we? The first thing I did on the debug menu was go to SE test which I assumed was a sound effect test, but it just showed me the result screen for the bonus dungeon and asked me if I wanted to create a save clear data. Then it took me back to the title screen. Set plate position allows you to move the name tags for the areas around you. This works on both the overworld and the district selection screen. There's a bit edit menu where you can see an all map and Zibalba option. Ticking all map will make all districts available to you no matter what point in the game you're at. Ticking Zibalba on will switch the overworld to being afloat the Torafune. Zibalba was the name of the ship in Innocent Sin, and the Torafune is what it's called in this game. Since Eternal Punishment is likely built off Innocent Sin, I'd assume it's likely using the same debug menu as that game. The Debug Watch 1 and 2 options let you observe certain info such as your exact position coordinates and other stuff as you move about the map. Did you get all that? Good. I know I kinda rushed through a lot of that. Let's take a brief intermission. I'll take this moment to give a special thank you to my patrons, as well as my first channel member. If you'd like to support me financially, you can join for a channel membership or pledge to my Patreon. 
Both are valid options, but Patreon's just a bit more preferable, just so not all my eggs are in one basket, you know? The reception on my last video was a huge motivation booster for me, so I'll continue to try to make the most interesting content possible. Now, onto the big one. I'm sure any of you who are familiar with my channel must know that I love Persona 3. It's a game that no matter how many times I've played or look back at it, I'm always learning something new about it. I didn't even know there was a prototype until I came up with the idea of looking for Persona prototypes for this video. There are clips of a very early beta where the game looks drastically different from the final game, but there's already a good video talking about this in more detail if you are so interested. For now, let's just focus on this build, from May 25th, 2007. The game actually boots up on a debug menu. The first option literally just lets you begin the game proper, and you can play through it normally. The difference is that pressing the right analog stick will open up a debug menu. This can let you view the textures for that area, including character model textures, display metrics, toggle sounds and background music on and off, but most importantly, you can cheat. You can add totally legit personas to your stock and even change your party members' personas. You can also technically set the protagonist's persona to any of the other characters' personas. But like, why would you want to do that? You can also preview the sprites and models of every persona in this game. The date changer does what you think it does, although it may not be immediately obvious that the date has changed. It doesn't change on the HUD, but if you exit and re-enter a room, you might notice the placement of NPCs might have changed. The most apparent giveaway is if you jump between seasons. You'll notice by the environment and the characters' uniforms changing that the date change has worked. The HUD date updates when you return to the dorm. You can also edit your social link ranks. Some of them are duplicates of the same arcana, but labeled Reserve in Katakana. There is a flag editor that, well, triggers flags. I don't know what any of these flags are supposed to be, but obviously this stuff wasn't really meant for our eyes. Only the developers would know or have some sort of dock on hand of what each of these would do. That being said, there's a lot of stuff here that I just straight up don't know how to use. The model viewer on the main menu seems to require you to have models on hand, which I obviously don't. Selecting a lot of things will often just result in a black screen requiring you to reset the game or load a save state. There are a few pretty straightforward things though. OPED simply plays the opening and ending FMVs for the game. They take you straight back to the title screen afterwards, but trying to actually begin the game from there will just take you back to the main menu. Then there's the dungeon editor. You can take the map tiles you see on the minimap while dungeon crawling and place those around. This doesn't create an actual dungeon, mind you. This is just the map we're talking about here. Then there's dungeon 1. It takes you straight to Tartarus with all the characters available. Well, almost all of them. Because you basically just started up the game with no progress, Mitsuru will still think she's your navigator, and she does still have her navigator lines for the first few sections of Tartarus. In dungeon and combat though, Fuka will still act as your support. Either way, you can still use the in-game debug menu to add Mitsuru to your party if you want. So you do still have all your party members, technically. They're all at their initial levels and equipment, and so are you. Setting Fuka as a party member will have another protagonist model with Junpei's UI portrait, and then the game will freeze. Shocker. Oh yeah, you're never given the chance to put in the main character's name, so it's just blank. Guess this video is obsolete now. Because you start immediately at level 1 without the free level up from the event battle at the beginning, you won't be able to collect any personas through shuffle time without leveling up. Another thing I've noticed is that the floor guardians on each checkpoint floor are completely absent, as well as the chest that's normally behind them. 
Down in the test section, you'll notice a bunch of names with different test functions under each of them. These are the names of the programmers, as you may have noticed if you paid attention during the end credits. A lot of these options do nothing, at least for us. So I'll go over the ones that actually do something. Under Cosada, there's a test option that'll place you inside a huge red sphere grid, and in the distance you can see white and yellow spheres as well. Under Nita, there's a sample that just displays a rainbow gradient with the word sample. Miwa shows the color palette for the main menu, as well as a test message and choice box with some placeholder text. There's also a font debug option. I'm not really sure what this does. Selecting any value here will just make that color value rapidly drop to zero. Under Sasaki, there's a grid that lets you zoom in and out and move the camera about. Under Yazi, there's an option called IMAP, which just displays an incomplete looking port island station with when moons reaching out stars playing in the background. There's also an option labeled ST parts. I don't exactly know what this is supposed to do. I put in some random values and then it took me to the dungeon floor selection menu. All the floor checkpoints are there, but the UI only displays the first block of Tartarus. Selecting any of them does nothing. Miyashita has the name entry menu and that's it. You may have noticed I skipped over Toyama and that's because he provides the most interesting features. This makes sense as he was the chief programmer. SFD play lets you play any of the FMV cutscenes in the game. Clear data does what you think it does. Memcard Convert didn't do anything for me, and the Memcard Debug option lets you reformat your memory card. The sound test is exactly what it sounds like. You can play voice clips and music tracks. Finally, I've saved the main event for last, the calendar. You can select any day throughout the game and begin playing from there. Keep in mind that you will literally start out with nothing. But what would happen if I forced the game to load on a day that isn't supposed to be playable? Let's load up a day before the game is supposed to begin. April 1st. The game gets really confused and just spawns you in a classroom after school. You'll notice there's no music, and despite the ambient noises of people talking, there's absolutely no one to be found. This is presumably because NPCs are only set to be spawned on certain day ranges, and we are outside of all of them right now. However, there is one person you can interact with. Go to where the sports clubs are practicing and you can actually join one of them. The social link events will play out normally. You can't really do any of the stack grinding activities because you have no money. So the only thing to do at night is study or sleep. The next day you'll be able to immediately do rank 2 of the chariot social link. However, the school will still be completely empty, so you'll have to walk over to the club. During this process, you can also set the flags for starting Yuko's social link, the Strength Arcana. The next day, you aren't able to go to your sports club, even though it's a Friday, so it should be in session right now. So you're left with no choice but to leave the school. You'll notice there are absolutely no leaves or bushes outside because the game doesn't know what season it should be right now. Going around town, you'll see it's just as empty as the school. Once again, there's nothing you can do with your lack of money other than go home. The next morning of Saturday, April 4th. For some reason, there's no school that day, even though you normally only get Sundays off in this game. It's not a holiday, otherwise the Saturday indicator on the HUD would be colored red. Kazushi will then invite you to hang out. If you say yes, you will see the spend time event play out like normal. The next day, you'll immediately start off the day at lunchtime with Kazushi approaching you. What? Not only do you never have school on a Sunday in this game, but Kazushi isn't even supposed to be available on this day. Either way, you know the drill. Run over to your club, play out the social link like normal, then you'll be able to initiate Yuko's social link. However, since you're unable to obtain any Personas of the Chariot, you won't be able to get the optimal points needed to rank it up again the next day. Finally, we reach the first official day of the game, April 7th. 
Upon transitioning into that day, the game will ask you to select a difficulty and then freeze. We did it guys, we broke Persona 3 without even starting the game. Now let's try something a bit different. Let's see what happens when you force the game to play the day after the game is supposed to end. Saturday, March 6th. MC wakes up from his little nap yesterday. No music or sound of students, even though the NPCs are where they should be. Or rather, where they're supposed to be on the final few days of the game. Junpei is still wondering who used to sit in that seat, even though he literally just remembered everything yesterday. Kazushi comments on how it's a nice day for a jog as usual. Because it's the end of the game, you can't really do anything but just go home. You are, however, still able to begin Kazushi's social link and continue about your days normally. Presumably until you loop back into April 7th to encounter the same force event to our playthrough as before. For those of you wondering what happens when you load a day that's supposed to be skipped, nothing. Nothing really happens. And yes, the game will make you play out each subsequent day that was supposed to be skipped if you do this. And remember, you chose this when you could have just slept through a week worth of school. Once again, this video ended up being much longer than I initially thought it would be. I know a lot of this just ended up being me digging around in debug mode, and there are likely ways of activating it in the final versions that I'm just not aware of. I just figured that regardless, these are still prototypes and it's a lot cooler to view these things from the perspective of someone who would have actually been working on these games. Part of me kind of actually feels nostalgic doing this kind of thing. Brings me back to the days of learning the basics of Click Team Fusion, the shittiest game engine ever, and a little bit of Unreal 4. Basically, just looking for ways to break a project and finding oversights to be fixed before submitting the final project. I'm not sure how many of you already know this, I only briefly mentioned it in one of my least viewed videos ever. I wanted to make games at one point, and I guess making one game is still something I'd like to do at some point, but I've put that dream on hold. I wasn't expecting to reconnect with my roots a little when making this video, but hey, shit happens, you know? To be completely honest with you, there's nothing inherently interesting about prototypes themselves. It's the stories that you can infer from them that make them interesting. When you really love a game, you'll always find yourself learning more about it.